Hello everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on our first Lipid Maps webinar, which will be presented live from Georgia Tech by Professor Al Merrill. Al is the Smith Gall Institute Chair of Molecular Cell Biology in the School of Biological Sciences and the Pettit Institute for Bioengineering and Biosciences at Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia, USA. And I am delighted to introduce him to present our first webinar. My name is uh, Valerie O'Donnell. I'm the Director of Division of Infection and Immunity at Cardiff University in the UK, and I'm the host introducing Al today. So we're delighted to have over 160 registered for our first ever Lipid Maps webinar. This is a new format for us, um, one we are very keen to continue. Indeed, Al's presentation today is the first of two in a series, uh, with the second upcoming on Tuesday the 15th uh, at 5 p.m. GMT. Given that sphingolipids is such a major area, it was impossible to cover this comprehensively in a single webinar. So Al is going to come back in two weeks and do the second part, particularly focusing on the analytical side. Uh, beyond that, we've got plans for several additional webinars over the next year. Each will be covering a specific category of lipid, focusing on their unique biochemistry and biology in detail. And we'll have more information available on this soon on the Lipid Maps website. Before we start, just a bit of housekeeping. If any of you have technical problems with either hearing or seeing the content, use the question and answer function at the bottom of your screen and just drop a note and Dawn Cotter, our webmaster, will be able to pick that up. Um, our scientific presentation is going to take about 45 minutes and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes of questions afterwards. So those of you listening in, use the question and answer function to send in questions during the presentation. Al can see all of these as they come up and he'll take as many at the end as time allows. The webinar will then be recorded on the website and posted as soon as possible. So I'd now like to move to introduce our speaker. So I'm honored to introduce Professor Al Merrill. Al has researched sphingolipids for nearly 40 years and his laboratory and his collaborators have spearheaded our understanding of sphingolipid structure and function metabolism and their interrelationships between sphingolipids and disease. This is an enormous area of lipid research and we are absolutely delighted to have Al's expertise here today. Al and Dr. Cameron Sullerts, who's now working with Avanti Polar Lipids, were the directors of the Sphingolipid and the Glycosphingolipid Core Lab for the first decade of Lipid Maps. And Al now serves as a member of our scientific advisory committee. He's also developed the um, really, really incredible Sphingo map. This is an expert curated pathway map of sphingolipid biochemistry, which I strongly recommend you to check out. And I'm pretty sure Al's going to be talking about this today. So I'll now hand over to Al to present this webinar entitled How to Navigate the Omics and of Sphingo and Lipidomics." Uh, thank you, Al, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you, Valerie. I appreciate your giving me the opportunity to talk about sphingolipids here and also to uh, thank you, those of you who are uh, joining, because I hope that you will find that this framework of thinking about sphingolipids, um, the relationship between their structures and their metabolism will help you interpret uh, information that you're seeing in lipidomic analyses a little more uh, easily. That's going to be the main theme of this first uh, basic sphingolipidology talk to go, give a survey of the types of structures that one finds, the metabolic pathways that are responsible for making them and turning them over, and a bit at the end about uh, functions and role in disease, but that itself is a huge topic. So the main idea is I'll say a few high points, but then uh, list the bibliography that will be uh, further expanded and made available for the online version of this so that if you want to uh, read about that on your own, it'll be available to you. Then as Valerie has said, the uh, analysis side of the story I'll be talking about in a, a separate uh, webinar in two weeks. So looking at this pathway from, I think the perspective of someone who's doing a lipidomic analysis. These are the kinds of questions that have uh, popped up the most. What types of lipids are present? Identification of the structures, of course. And then how much uh, to the extent that one can uh, evaluate that based on standards and so forth. Uh, that's a challenge, obviously, but the idea is that if one has knowledge about what's been seen before and also some ideas about what would be likely to be made in this pathway by knowing uh, 
what types of enzyme reactions can occur, then the partnership between those two uh, types of information uh, help with that question of lipidomic analysis. <clears throat> and where do they originate and where might they be going? Uh, how are they interrelated uh, for those pathways where you have the uh, situation whereby uh, perturbing one step of the pathway, you may then divert into another uh, arm of the pathway. And so having that in mind helps you know what to look for. And then, as I say, obviously, ultimately, you want to know, are they normal, abnormal? What effect that may be having on the functions that are related to those molecules? And does this play a role in disease? The idea of this webinar is to help you get started first by looking at the lipid maps web page, which has some of this information, and then uh, the supplement that I'm going to be providing you in the webinar. The Lipid Maps website has uh, quite a bit of information about uh, sphingolipids and sphingolipid metabolism already. So if you uh, click on that at your leisure, you'll find, for example, as on this face page, a tutorial section that opened up can take you specifically to uh, different categories of lipids. You open that up to the introduction of lipids, and the, there's a subsection on sphingolipids that has the textural definition and a core structure. That core structure expanded, then lets me point out that, of course, the defining feature of the sphingolipids is that they'll have uh, some type of sphingoid base backbone, with sphingosine being the one that's most often referred to because quantitatively it's the major species in mammals and uh, many other organisms, <clears throat> a long alkyl chain with a, a hydroxyl group at the one position, two position, three position for sphingosine in the 2S3R stereochemistry and for the specific molecule sphingosine, an unsaturated sphingoid base, a 4E double bond in the 4-5 position. These are further elaborated by uh, N acylation and head group addition, and we'll go through each of those topics uh, sequentially. So many people know that the nature, the reason for the strange name for this family of molecules is that J O W Titicum, uh, published, who first published on these molecules, commented in uh, three different. Uh, publications that in commemoration of the Amina Enigmas, which he presented to the Enquirer, he gave the name of Sphingosin. The most often cited reference for this is uh, Turicum's tome about brain chemistry, the chemistry of the brain published in 1884. But one can actually dig back earlier into publications by Turicum and see, as indicated at the bottom of this page, that he had uh, described it first in a report uh, to the funding agency for his research about finding this molecule and uses almost the ident identical uh, phraseology and as well a journal that he created himself, Annals of Chemical Medicine in 1881. So you'll variously see uh, these other um, publications cited as the origin of the name sphingosine and they're all valid, although if you want to take it back to the very first uh, one, it would be the 1879-1880 document. The uh, more precisely uh, quantified uh, uh, sphingosin, that is, uh, Tudicum uh, and all investigators at the time were basically defining new molecules by their carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen uh, percentages and uh, some of their physical characteristics, defining them as new molecules. Uh, he was close, but uh, a refinement of the uh, chemical structure was conducted by Klink in 1929. And then the full structure uh, determined by Herb Carter in uh, 1947. And it was Herb Carter who actually proposed that the whole family of molecules that had a sphingosine or sphingoid base backbone be defined as sphingolipids. There's a uh, abbreviation uh, methodology that's used for these molecules. It's shown on this slide, indicating that one often uses a D uh, term to refer to the number of hydroxyl groups on the sphingoid base, 
dihydroxy, as you see here for sphingosine, a number then indicating the total number of carbons in the alkyl chain, colon, a number indicating the number of double bonds, and then any other information telling you what you know about the species. So if you know that it's a four or five trans double bond, you would add four E as indicated here. Th this is just the tip of the iceberg for the molecules that are found in mammalian sphingolipids and more broadly for the known sphingoid bases across various organisms. The one that we've referred to and most people talk about sphingosine shown here is uh, obviously, the, as I've said, the major species in mammals, but uh, there are also uh, substantial amounts, if, depending on where you look, for example, in skin, of the 4-hydroxy sphingonine, locally referred to as phytosphingosine, that would be a T180 because it has a third uh, hydroxyl group and there's no double bonds in it. So 4-hydroxy uh, sphingonine is another mammalian sphingoid base. A biosynthetic precursor to sphingosine and hydroxy sphingonine and a species found in certain places in substantial amounts itself is sphingonine shown here. And most people know about those three sphingoid bases. What's a little less broadly known is that there is a fair amount of chain link variation of sphingoid bases depending on where you look, uh, typically from 16 carbons to 20 carbons in length. And likewise, double bonds from zero, one to two, rarely a larger number. And shown below this is the major a dying form of uh, sphingoid bases in mammals, the 4E14Z sphingodyne. There are also in some places uh, species with hydroxyl groups at additional positions like 4-hydroxy sphingosine, a sphingolipid found in skin. And the species that's been found uh, just in the last uh, decade or so, uh, shown on the bottom, a family of sphingoid bases that lack uh, one of the hydroxyl groups, uh, the so-called 1-deoxysphingonine, an unsaturated version of that, and 1-deoxymethylsphingonine that lacks both the terminal hydroxyl and terminal meth methylene group found in uh, all mammals, uh, but in elevated amounts in certain uh, hereditary diseases we'll talk about later. If one scans across other organisms, there's a huge number of other types of uh, variants from uh, other types of chain link and double bond species, uh, variations in branching, uh, and so forth is seen here. Some of those have to be taken into account in the mammalian sphingolipidome because if you consume them, uh, say in the diet, uh, they'll at least be in your GI tract and perhaps some absorbed. The second family, of course, are the ceramides. is a broad category, the anacial sphingoid bases, the fatty acids, primarily of 14 to 30, sometimes a little longer uh, carbon atoms, mostly saturated or monounsaturated, but there are cases of polyunsaturated fatty acids as well. And sometimes the fatty acids are alpha hydroxylated or in skin, omega hydroxylated, where there's addition of a, another fatty, third fatty acid or a third alkyl chain, I should say, that. Um, makes it a very complex species and accounting for the barrier properties of skin. The third uh, region of the molecule that one often focuses on is the so-called head group. And then the lyso family of head groups, you would have molecules like sphingosine 1-phosphate, a sphingosine phosphorylcholine, sort of lysosphingomyelin, or glycans such as cycosine, galactosyl sphingosine, or other uh, lyso forms of glycosphingolipids with the broad numbers of categories here shown. In the complex form, which is typically referred to as those sphingolipids with uh, an inacial chain anti-head group, you could have the phosphate for ceramide phosphate, ceramide phosphoethanolamines, a species in very small amount in mammals, but uh, in much larger amounts in other organisms, insects, for example, uh, ceramide phosphocholine locally, the sphingomyelin, and glycosphingolipids. There's also a family of uh, ceramides that have an uh, acyl group on it at the one position. So head groups can be hydrogen, 
fatty acid, phosphodiester linkage, some organisms even phosphono linkages or glycans. The mammalian glycans are, uh, go from simple to very complex. Simple would be just with a sim single sugar or sometimes two to many and nobody really knows for sure what the highest number is. Um, the uh, glycans are subdivided into globo, isoglobo, lacto, neolacto, and ganglio families based on what additional sugars are added after glucose and galactose, so-called lactosyl ceramide as a backbone. And there is a family that instead of attaching glucose as the first sugar, you attach galactose instead, so galactosyl ceramide, and a small number of further elaborations of that we'll talk about in a minute. And the directory of the major uh, sugars is shown here, including fructose uh, and uh, fucose and the uh, um, uh, sialic acid. The sialic acid being an uh, uh, inacetyl duramatic acid, although one also finds uh, some levels of n glycolyl uh, neuromatic acid, which uh, is not made by uh, humans, but made by other mammals. One should note that the beta linkage is, uh, as far as we know, uh, always produced by the mammalian enzymes for uh, addition of the first sugar to the ceramide backbone. But that said, alpha linkages are common in uh, some other organisms and in particular have recently been found to be produced by some of the microorganisms that are part of the GI microflora, which is likely to have imp uh, profound uh, implications for physiology because alpha galactosyl ceramides are potent immunomodulators. And there are several papers in the literature dealing with this topic, but one that's recently been published in Journal of Lipid Research from uh, Roger Santoff's lab is talking about the bacterial immunogenic alpha galactosyl ceramides in the uh, murine large intestine and uh, how it's modulated by a number of factors, including diet and inflammation. The sphingomap that Valerie referred to before was a diagram where we compile information from the literature of the different types of head group variants that had been found. And you can't see it in this scale, but uh, those species would have a solid uh, box around them. And then we basically filled in what was missing, uh, because if you have a sugar, six, eight uh, sugar uh, head group, uh, but the seven has not yet been reported. There's obviously going to be a, a, a seven species in between, and sometimes we had to uh, make some uh, approximations of what might be the alternative ways to get to a particular species. So they're in the sphingo map uh, defined by dashes around the line. But our hope is that by creating a model like this that defines what the uh, possibilities are, or probabilities, you might even go so far to say that as research is done in this subject and species are discovered, one can uh, confirm parts of the map and also eliminate others and uh, further refine the uh, rigorous pathway for all of the molecular species that are made. It's often uh, noted that the field of sphingolipid research uh, is bifurcated into sometimes re reference to it as the field sphingolipids and glycosphingolipids, for example, that's the name of the Gordon Conference that's handled, uh, that's uh, given on this subject. That's fully appropriate uh, and historical. And the main reason behind it is that the fields that studied the lipid, more lipid-like sphingolipids, those compounds that were very hydrophobic and uh, partition into organic solvents, et cetera. Um, and the techniques that one used for studying those tended to be somewhat different from what one uh, used if you were going primarily after, uh, say, glycosphingolipids that were, were sufficiently water soluble that they went into the aqueous phase of an organic solvent extraction. And so the, but I think as time 
will go on with the techniques being able to encompass both fields. One will uh, more generically use the term uh, sphingolipids to uh, uh, encompass everything. But I mention it just by way of someone that's new to the field and wondering, uh, is there something about the glycosphingolipids that would make them uh, not sphingolipids? And in fact, no, they're, they all have the commonalities and points that we'll be talking about for the initial backbone synthesis then be a, being elaborated for uh, the uh, more complex molecules by different categories of head group addition. And I will be loading on the website for uh, when this full presentation is made available, a bibliography if you want to go into literature and find more about this. Also useful on the Lipid Maps website are links where you can uh, find structure drawing tools and find uh, the spectrum of molecules that are present in the literature as you see here. I'll just click through a few of these. You would find them if you went through the web pages yourself, but as you can see, you open up tools that let you draw molecules based on what backbone features you wanna build into it, the nature of the lipid, the nature of the head group, and there are multiple ways you can go into that in searching these molecules. So those are sort of the background of the types of things that are there. Now flipping again to the thinking about this as a lipidologist, um, you do an analysis and for this case it was our analyzing pla uh, human plasma sphingomyelins. <clears throat> you go into the different species that are uh, shown. This is just looking at uh, mass spec scan uh, for head group loss. So uh, each of these uh, ions represents the uh, a, a number of backbone uh, isomers. And then we do a, you do an isomer analysis of it. And you see, for example, that this particular peak was reflective of a portion that was the diene backbone and a 16 fatty acid, sphingosine as the backbone and a 16 one fatty acid, and even small amounts of a shorter chain sphingoid base with a longer chain fatty acid. So there's a lot of uh, that structural variability going on. And so we want to back up and figure out where does that 16 one sphingoid base come from? Same way for odd uh, numbered uh, backbone bases, et cetera. So for looking at the metabolic pathway and trying to understand the origin of these things, there's an Another tool on the Lipid Maps website, a nice primer on sphingolipids prepared by Ed Dennis. I would sort of refer to this as Sphingolipids 101. That points out what's generally known about the pathway, beginning with palmitoyl CoA plus serine to make the 18 carbon species, making a three keto intermediate that's rapidly reduced by NADPH to make sphingonine that's acylated to make dihydroceramides, then oxidized, introduce the four or five trans double bond or hydroxylated, uh, doesn't, not shown here, to make the um, phyto family. <clears throat> to get the actual molecule sphingosine, you don't encounter it as an intermediate of de novo biosynthesis, but rather once you've introduced the double bond, to make a ceramide, the hydrolysis of that ceramide by ceramidase to release the free sphingoid base. So technically, sphingosine is an, an intermediate of Nova biosynthesis as the free molecule just via dihydroceramides going to ceramides. Serine palmitoyl transferase obviously plays a really important role in this process. It's an interesting enzyme. It's a member of the O-oxoamine synthase family that is pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzymes that make a shift base with serine labelizing the alpha hydrogen so that it can act as a nucleophile to kick out the CoA leaving group of the fatty aso coa and ultimately make the keto intermediate that can hydrolyze from the enzyme, uh, restoring the uh, enzyme to the shift base linkage with an active site uh, lysine. As a, as a pyridoxal phosphate a dependent enzyme, one can uh, use various uh, inhibitors of pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzymes to block it 
but more specifically, it's because all of them also affect other uh, pyridoxal phosphate dependent enzymes of one kind or another. Uh, a more selective inhibitor is myriosin, and some synthetic uh, selective inhibitors have also been developed in recent years. What's really interesting and important about serine palmitoyl transferase from the lipidomic perspective we're talking about here is that it's comprised of multiple subunits. The core unit is a dimer of SBTLC1 subunit plus either SBTLC2 or LC SBT2B, which is named SBTLC3, and small subunits of the human serine palmitoyl transferase, which are functionally analogous to a small peptides that are found in yeast. In addition, there are uh, interacting with the subunits of serine palmitoyl transferase other proteins, and one that has gotten a lot of attention is the RRMDL uh, proteins because they are uh, regulators of serine palmitoyl transferase activity. But what's you know, the story behind these subunits. The story is, is that the combinations that you get of the subunits determine what the selectivity is for the fatty ACE-CoA. So the traditional serine palmitoyl transferase activity that we think about of utilizing palmitoyl CoA and serine resides in SBT1, SBT2A, and the short chain SBTA, preferring 16O. The alternative combination of the SSBTB prefers longer acyl coas It will still bind uh, palmitoyl CoA, but it will use longer chains as well, and that accounts for the families of longer chain sphingoid bases produced by mammals. Alternatively, the use of SBT1, SBT2B, that is the SBTLC3, and this uh, short chain SBT now shifts the selectivity to shorter chain fatty acyl CoA C14 and then also shares 16 and accounts for forming the sphingoid base family with 16 carbon atoms. So by knowing what uh, families of SBTs correlate with what type of sphingoid base, you can use what you find here to predict what you find here or conversely, what you're finding when you do the lipidomic analysis can take you back to thinking about what are the uh, forms of serine palmitoyl transferase that are the origin of those molecular subspecies. That accounts for uh, the variation in the chain length we talked about a moment ago, 16, 17, if you're using an odd chain fatty ASOCOA, 18, then 19 again for an odd chain fatty ASOCOA, and 20. Uh, what about the, how the double bond is added or additional double bonds? Or well, how do we account for the species that lack the one hydroxyl group? I'll cover the latter first. The so-called typical sphingoid bases we've just covered, but these deoxy ones are referred to as atypical sphingoid bases. And the short and long of that story is that they're made by serine palmitoyl transferase promiscuity, as it was referred to, uh, by Teresa Dunn, in that the enzyme prefers serine greatly over other amino acids that can fit into the binding pocket of the enzyme, but it will indeed accommodate alanine to some extent and glycine less well at alanine. And when these alternative amino acids are used, you get the deoxysphingoid bases. Wild type serine palmitoyl transferases will utilize all three, but with great preference for serine you have an increase in the formation of the deoxysphingoid bases, however, when there are mutations in the serine palmitoyl transferase that alter that preference. For example, in the human sensory neuropathies discovered by Horneman and collaborators, they found that mutations that uh, increase the utilization of alanine and glycine so that you have apparently levels of deoxysphingoid bases being formed that contribute to the disease. This, however, is a fascinating option that the even wild type serine palmitoyl transferase can utilize multiple substrates because you obviously have uh, these three amino acids interrelated with many steps of intermediary, intermediary metabolism. And indeed, when these are altered, you can also alter the, the types of sphingoid bases that are made.
regarding the double bonds and hydroxyl groups, those come from a family of enzymes called DESs, which are responsible for DES1, 4, 5 desaturation, DES2, 4 hydroxylation, and for uh, some of the uh, other uh, introductions of double bonds and hydroxylations, probably via some families of cytochrome P450s. These occurring at the stage in mammals uh, past the acylation of the sphingidine backbone. This is an interesting subject because there's a number of uh, molecules that inhibit the desaturases, such as finretinide 4-HPR, and also there are uh, apparently fairly profound consequences of this inhibition, as illustrated by this recently done paper from Scott Summers' group, that uh, the degree of uh, desaturation can influence insulin resistant and uh, hepatic health. How about the, what are the determinants of which fatty acids are added? That's defined by the ceramide synthases as a subfamily with different families of uh, different individual ceramide synthases having the uh, fatty acyl CoA selectivity shown here, as well as by the elongases that make the longer chain fatty acyl uh, CoAs and in some cases, actual physical interactions between the elongase and the ceramide synthase. So it's an a interesting story related to what determines which uh, ceramide synthases are expressed and their interaction with other uh, parts of the de novo biosynthetic pathway. Also, as an interesting part of the story is the, uh, what's the selectivity of these ceramide synthases for sphingoid uh, bases um, and uh, the fact, for example, that a CRS1 is a ceramide synthase for which it appears that the D16 sphingoid base uh, may be used uh, more readily than the D18 family. Another uh, family of uh, molecules are important in this step are the fumonisins, which are inhibitors of ceramide synthesis and happen to also be substrates for ceramide synthase. Moving to the head group, obviously a very complex story in its own right. If we think about the phosphodiester-linked head groups for mammals, the sphingomyelins and the ceramide phosphoethanolamines, there are three uh, categories of sphingomyelin synthases. SMS1, uh, located in the Golgi, uh, specific for sphingomyelin synthesis, as best I understand. Sphingomyelin uh, synthase 2, which is in the plasma membrane, makes sphingomyelin, but has the capacity to also make ceramide phosphoethanolamines. This is by, in both cases, transesterification reactions with either phosphatidylcholine for sphingomyelin or phosphatidylethanolamine for ceramide phosphatidylethanolamine, and SMS2 that um, seems to be able to make both an SMS R, I may have misspoken here, that's in the ER lumen that just makes ceramide phosphoethanolamines. This point of branching is a really important one because as you now think about what's happening in the biosynthetic pathway, in vision we've made a particular a ceramide or dihydroceramide, it has the option of being converted to a sphingomyelin, to being converted to a ceramide phosphoethanolamine, possibly phosphorylated to a ceramide phosphate, or glycosylated to glucosyl ceramide or galactosyl ceramide. So it's an important branch point where the fate of a given uh, ceramide backbone is going to be determined by the nature of the expression of the specific enzymes at that branch point, and the subcellular localization of where the ceramide is uh, present. So that, for example, if the ceramide resides in the endoplasmic reticulum for a long period of time, uh, allowing it to have greater access to the ER lumen, then it's going to have readily access to the uh, gal sear synthase, whereas if it's trafficked to the Golgi, more likely for uh, glucosyl ceramide synthase or for the trans-Golgi or sphingomyelin. So an important issue in this is going to be the location of the enzymes, relative levels of expression, 
and any factors that are part of trafficking. So when we start thinking about the pathway in terms of the molecules that are involved and a, another tier of complexity of the subcellular localization, you can see why this begins to be a very omic uh, type of thing to think about. One has to contemplate what are the forms of the SPT and what type of sphingoid base would be made. I only show you one in this particular diagram. How that is converted into different chain link species of dihydroceramides that can be desaturated to ceramides or hydroxylated as we talked about a minute ago for uh, the phyto family. At each of these, the branch point for what sort of head group is going to be added. As you notice, there's also an option for these intermediates turning over so that you can have in the de novo synthesis pathway synthesis of sphingonine that's phosphorylated or to go ahead and make sphingomyelin and turn it over to make sphingosine that's phosphorylated. And then these can either be recycled or degraded by a sphingosine 1-phosphate lyase that cleaves the backbone. The recycling is probably a fairly important step of this pathway once these things are made and turned over. And indeed, some of the enzymes for turning over ceramides also reside in the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, arguing for there being a mechanism for that sort of recycling, as well as the salvaging of sphingolipids that are present in the other locations in the cell are taken up by endocytosis. And of course, we always have to keep in mind that these molecules are bioactive. The sphingoid bases, the sphingoid base phosphates, the ceramides, the dihydroceramides. So the cell is producing uh, bioactive molecules as part of de novo synthesis, and as part of turnover. But by mapping them to a pathway, when you see a specific molecule, this sort of diagram tells you um, what was the biosynthetic origin. That's given you this simple picture of making the uh, molecules that have a single moiety on the head group. We then grow this pathway by saying, once you make glucosyl ceramide, a portion is glycosylated to lactosyl ceramide, a major backbone for complex glycosphingolipid synthesis. Or in the galactose family, you can, once you've made galactosyl ceramide, a portion is converted into digalactosyl, et cetera, but also a portion is sulfated to make the so-called sulfatides. So we begin to expand this pathway and think about the enzymes that are responsible for it. So as if one sees a particular change of gene expression, you start making predictions about what's going to happen, or conversely, you see the metabolites appear. You may start thinking about what's going on in gene expression, trafficking, that's accounting for those shifts. This diagram from a review I published back in 2011 gives you expansion of that into the major root families that I showed you earlier in the structure. The root family for uh, after lactose formation to go into the uh, ganglio series is shown here. So we're basically just talking about different glycosyl transferases to add head groups of particular types to make more complex molecules. For the globo series, different uh, glycosyl transferase for the lacto and neolacto family. This is also another family that's found in mammals, the isoglobo series, but this enzyme is lacking for humans, so it's not uh, part of our uh, pathway. And for any one of these branches, especially nicely shown uh, for the ganglioside biosynthesis, one really is dealing with something that's like a combinatorial synthesis pathway in that you have a, as a single molecule is moving through the pathway, it has the potential to be partitioned off in the side pathways to make more complex molecules um, with additional cell functions, for example. We can first add a sialic acid to ganglioside GM3 to make ganglioside GM2, but if instead you add a beta-4 galactosamine, then if you have it uh, acting as a, a substrate for uh, uh, the, sci the same sialyl transferase, you can go to in a different a direction for uh, a combination of uh, complex sphingolipids downstream from the original precursors. 
And what's important about that is that as you uh, alter uh, one direction for a pathway, say you enhance something drawing molecules off this direction, then you're removing intermediates that might otherwise move this direction. Or alternatively, if you block this, then you're going to be forcing intermediates down this path. So sphingolipid metabolism is one where shifts in direction can occur through those routes. And then I'm not going to say much about, but I would still want to give uh, attention to and deference to the idea that for all of these molecules, there are uh, well-characterized pathways for their degradation. And these were some of the first enzymes discovered because of uh, genetic defects in uh, them that result in various family of sphingolipidosis diseases. So how are they interrelated? As you've seen, this is a very complex question uh, because there's so many molecules and such a complex pathway and so many branch points. My view is that we need to move to an era where we think about pathways that aren't just simple uh, linear pathways like one typically finds in a textbook or most review articles, but rather ones that say, can we track an individual molecule to all of the possible things that can be converted to? For example, the pathway I showed you before making sphingonine that could be converted to dihydroceramides and the different head group species or desaturated to the ceramide family and then those partition into more complex sphingolipids or be hydrolyzed back to the sphingosine backbone. And this is just the tip of the iceberg at the first level of the pathway, because if we look at now adding the different complex glycosphingolipid uh, uh, pathways beyond that, and this is an example from the sphingo map of the different molecular species that likely reside in each of these, you end up now with a diagram where each of these wedges uh, is comprised of you know, typically possibly hundreds of uh, downstream uh, molecules, but they will not necessarily all just be the same because they have the same head group, but they will have a history of what their backbone is going to be. And if we now take that concept that each one of these uh, represents hundreds of, uh, of molecules, of head group variants based on this particular backbone, and we realize the different types of uh, sphingoid bases that can be made by the different serine palmitoyl well transferases, then we have to consider all of these individual uh, rings in this family. And we can even add the deoxy family molecules. So I think we come up with a pathway that is the admittedly uh, incredibly complex, but the true pathway for how these individual molecules are made, so that if you knew that this specific molecule here, would imagine underneath that arrow, was uh, found in a lipidomic analysis, you'd be able to track it back and understand exactly what its origin was. Now that's not where we are right now. We're really only at a more simple level where we deal with some diagram like this one of a more finite number of species and use, say, a heat map to illustrate what goes up or what goes down and compare that to a simpler pathway map looking at the gene expression. So um, realistically, we're not there yet. But that said, um, I think that it will be the challenge for the future to work with this sort of uh, technology today uh, of re representing the things that change in a pathway, molecules and genes, but uh, figuring out how to go to a point where we'll be able to track every single molecule into a pathway diagram. The issue of, you know, what are the functions and how are they associated with the disease? Each of, if I was to try to cover each of these, it would be a webinar in itself. So all I will say as a quick refresh of your uh, memory is that the functions of the sphingolipids go from structural roles and membranes, lipoprotein, skin, uh, where the specific uh, features of a given molecule will determine their biophysical properties and do they, for example, uh, have a biophysical property that uh, contributes to their forming microdomains that 
have certain roles in the receptor function or endocytosis? Uh, do they uh, affect the skin barrier, as I referred to earlier, for the very long chain? Uh, uh, oh, uh, acyl, omega acylated uh, ceramides of skin. They are important in interacting with the extracellular matrix in neighboring cells, especially complex glycosphingolipids, where a particular ganglioside, say, will bind to a particular receptor or to a uh, 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 selectin that uh, is a, a, a recognition of the cell surface of its external environment and vice versa. And of course, their involvement in uh, intracellular and extracellular signaling. Their association with disease, they range from hereditary defects in turnover first characterized, but now it's for most, if not all of the enzymes in the biosynthetic pathway, uh, gen uh, genetic uh, variation has been uh, discovered that uh, can, in extreme cases, cause disease and non-hereditary genetic changes as are found in diseases such as cancer. Metabolic diseases such as uh, NASH clearly have a uh, sphingolipid component, diabetes and others. Iatrogenic diseases, that is, uh, diseases caused by drugs, um, or many cases now side effects of drugs being related to how they perturb sphingolipid metabolism, and environmental factors from diet to um, the toxins, toxin being something like the fumonisins. And I'll be uh, posting also with the presentation some examples of uh, survey descriptions of this, an elegant review by Yusuf Anun and Lino Bede, uh, doing the scope of structure and function and disease, but inborn errors of metabolism by Teresa Dunn and uh, Richard Crowey and on down the line, so that those who want to follow up that subject can do so later. So that's, uh, I hope, help uh, put in the context of what the pathway looks like uh, in the most detailed manner for which one knows a lot about many of the enzymes along the way, not every enzyme, but many and enough that it's exciting to think about what one can do in terms of making predictions as well as interpretations of what you see. And trying to build that into a bigger and bigger picture. What I'll talk about in the next webinar is analytical methods for analyzing sphingolipids and some, chan some challenges in that uh, field, mostly spinning off from lipid maps, but also uh, technologies that have been developed um, uh, along the way. And what I also want to throw out a question about, which would, I'd be interested in hearing from people, excuse me, in the, um, is whether or not this type of activity is one that the field is interested in and that perhaps we would follow up these lecture type webinars with short uh, discussion groups of particular subtopics. For example, it would be very interesting to have a number of people who work in the area of structure and function talk about specific species. So with so, that- uh, Yeah, to Al, I was just, just gonna jump in exactly, but you preempted me with the final slide here, the questions and comments. Um, so this, this was a phenomenal um, tour de force in relation to an extremely complicated area. The number and the complexity and the diversity of these structures is just truly mind-blowing. Um, is there, uh, there's a number of questions here now. I think if you go down, Al, to the Q&A down at the bottom, the questions should pop up. So we have about 10 minutes left if you'd like to take some of those and answer them for our attendees. And there's ones uh, at the beginning about uh, methodologies, which what I'll do is I'll actually uh, save those till the next one, simply to say that uh, for a short answer for a question about the, that um, methodologies is I'm going to be focusing in the next talk about mass spectrometry, but I'll also be giving some comments to uh, complementary methodologies like NMR or use of lectins to bind the specific uh, head group family glycolipids. So yes, indeed, with the structures being so complex, um, it's probably going to be necessary to have a profile of complementary tools that will be used for full characterization of it. That said, the mass spectrometry, especially when combined with things like uh, liquid chromatography uh, or IM ability methods for separating uh, species based on 
uh, more than just structure, but confirmation. Uh, there's a lot of information that will be able to be gotten uh, of these molecules by a mass spectrometry approach. Going farther down the list of questions, um, we had one about how are sphingolipids uh, metabolized. Um, uh, for example, is there a relationship between uh, uh, sphingolipid um, and peroxisomal uh, beta oxidation? And there is uh, a uh, there are a couple of links between uh, the uh, catabolism of sphingolipids and other organelles. Uh, mitochondria obviously being a uh, very important uh, player for this because of mitochondrial uh, beta oxidation. But the mitochondria is sort of a whole story in itself because mitochondria has both the uh, capacity to synthesize uh, sphingolipids and to turn them over. And an excellent review by Lena Obeid has gone over the subject of mitochondrial sphingolipid metabolism. Uh, but the peroxisome too is an organelle that's responsible for the very long chain fatty acids that are a part of the very long chain ceramides. And obviously that uh, provides a link between the two pathways of metabolism and other organelles. Um, there's a co comment about a uh, degree of saturation and what role that plays in uh, the signaling and uh, biological activity. And that's a, a very active area of uh, research right now. Uh, I've referred, I think, in my talk to the paper in science by Scott Summers' lab, but there are many others as well that have looked at dihydroceramides versus ceramides and what their effects are on cell behavior. And the um, simple story is that uh, dihydroceramides, when they accumulate, can do things like uh, induce cells to uh, uh, undergo autophagy and all the sequelae of things that can happen uh, from that. And conversely, when, the, when dihydroceramides are uh, accumulating, they're uh, going to not be doing the things that are selective for ceramides, like Yusuf Anun's lab had shown the essentiality of the double bond in uh, activating uh, phosphoprotein phosphatases. So the, um, the relationship between the uh, presence or absence of the four or five trans double bond for dihydroceramides and ceramides uh, looks like it is uh, a, a player in both the biochemistry and the uh, physiology of what happens uh, in this pathway. What is a, more of a mystery is the other uh, species, for example, the uh, sphingodyne, and it's uh, much, much less is known about that. And I'd be eager to find out what will happen as those are characterized. Um, there's a question about uh, the, the, for the sphingolipids that have hydroxylated fatty acids, what are uh, their functions? The simplest answer to that is uh, for the location and skin, the alpha hydroxy group on the fatty acid and the extra hydroxyl on the sphingoid based backbone for the phyto uh, sphingosine type backbone for many skin sphingolipids uh, uh, participate in uh, hydrogen bonding with the neighboring ceramides so that by putting a hydrogen bonding species in the interfacial region between the hydrophobic core of a membrane and the hydrophilic exterior, uh, the presence of that uh, uh, hydrogen bonding or even just dipolar uh, species in that position uh, tends to um, uh, create uh, greater uh, intermolecular interactions and uh, add greater uh, stability to that sort of structure as it provides for skin barrier function. Um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't mean to, to hit that button. <laughs> this was a, a follow-up pictures in case I got a question related to it. Um, there's questions about uh, G protein coupled receptors in this pathway, and that's a very large story by itself. 
looking at sphingosine 1-phosphate and sphingosine 1-phosphate signaling <clears throat> through uh, G-protein coupled receptors. And uh, I wouldn't uh, pretend to be able to uh, give the answer to that, but uh, reviews from multiple laboratories, uh, especially Sarah Spiegel's, uh, but Tim Law and others that have looked at the receptors for sphingosine 1-phosphate and the downstream signaling events would be a good place to go for that. There's a question about, is there a database summarizing the tissue uh, organ um, expression of particular sphingolipids uh, and their uh, connection to disease? To be honest, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't think there is um, a, a database uh, connecting those two yet. But there are in various publications uh, fairly uh, extensive studies where a particular database, a gene expression database, for example, has been looked at across multiple steps of the pathway uh, to try to tease out of that. Uh, is there any information from that uh, gene expression that helps you understand the disease better? Uh, for example, uh, many years ago, uh, Amin Momin in my laboratory looked at the gene expression data for the 60 cancer cell lines in the NIH uh, drug screening uh, uh, library and put the uh, relative uh, levels of expression of those enzymes on a pathway map paper that was published in journal lipid research. And you see some commonalities uh, pop up in a lot of the cancers, for example, sphingosine kinases tend to be elevated in many uh, categories of cancer. So there's a fair amount of information out, um, but I don't think it's yet been uh, compiled into one uh, global database that would help those associations uh, be made more uh, easily. Lipid maps, is what, hoping to head in that direction as the bioinformatic tools become available, but it's uh, on the agenda more than something that's yet been accomplished. Uh, there's a comment about uh, the C20 uh, uh, sphingolipids, uh, and I think if one references back to earlier slide that I have when I post these, you'll see that there is in fact a, uh, uh, a, a longer, there's a, probably an explanation for that species based on the um, um, type of uh, serine palmitoyl transferase subunits that are expressed in the location where you find them. Um, thank you for turning off the slides. They were... Okay, so I think we're, we're down to the, the last... Two. Yeah, I don't know what's happened to the slides there, Al. We seem to have gone to a black screen, but the, the timing is actually perfect because we really are into the last two minutes. So I just want to wrap up by thanking everybody for attending. I think it's been a, a, a phenomenal first session. We're really excited about this format. We've had no technical hitches, which is really impressive considering that we've never done anything like this before. Um, and I really, first of all, want to flag the second webinar from Al in two weeks, uh, which will be following up on the analytical challenges of sphingolipids, which I'm sure is a uh, is, is pretty comprehensive um, area that, that uh, will be really useful. And also Al has kindly offered that if your question wasn't answered, he will be happy to link up with participants by email. So feel free to drop him a line if he hasn't been able to answer your email um, in the time allowed. So just to finish up, really, I want to thank Al very much for uh, presenting today. Um, we'll be back in two weeks. And thank you all for attending. It's, it's been a real pleasure to uh, present this first Lipid Maps webinar. So goodbye. <laughs>